Hello, everybody. My name is Shelby Brown. I'm a senior education specialist at the Getty Villa, and I'd like to welcome you to the Villa's latest Bacchus Uncorked program, our first virtual program. This is our series that explores art, wine, and culture in the ancient world and usually focuses on the grape, but um, we are sure that Bacchus approves of all forms of fermented beverage. And our presentation today is Mesopotamia, Civilization Begins with Beer. And this talk is logically associated with our current exhibition, which is more broadly focused than beer, called Mesopotamia, Civilization Begins. And it will be on view at the villa until August 16th. Our speaker is archaeologist and historian Tate Paulette of North Carolina State University, who is an expert on ancient beer and alcoholic beverages. And he's written very widely on ancient agriculture, grains, fermentation, and he's participated in recreating Mesopotamian beer. So we'll put more about him and his publications into the chat. But I do want to note that unlike many scholars who write on beer, he takes inebriation into account um, as he writes about ancient politics and state formation. And he has a very recent publication on that topic in the Journal of Anthropological Archaeology. He also offered up um, suggestions for modern brews with some ancient characteristics. And there was a link on the reservations page to a handout with his suggestions. And we'll enter that in the chat as well, in case you want to find some of them after the talk. Meanwhile, some of you may already be sitting with a brew or just a beverage, and we hope that you will sit back, sip, and enjoy learning about beer. We will eventually get you back to the villa and be able to offer you sips ourselves of whatever brews we're talking about. For now, enjoy virtually. We invite you to enter your questions as they come to you into the Q&A panel, and Tate will answer them at the end. So please enjoy Tate's presentation. Hi, everyone. My name is Tate Paulette. I'm an archaeologist and an assistant professor in the history department at North Carolina State University. Today, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about beer, very old beer. We may be living in the age of craft brewing, but the craft of brewing has much deeper roots. Today, we're going to take a little trip back in time to visit ancient Mesopotamia one of the world's first great beer cultures. Thanks very much to the Getty for inviting me to present this talk as a sort of beer pairing to go along with their exhibition, Mesopotamia Civilization Begins. If you're so inclined, I would absolutely recommend that you sort out your own beer pairing to go along with my lecture. Here's my plan for the talk. We'll start out with a very quick intro to Mesopotamia and a quick intro to the evidence for beer in Mesopotamia before diving down into a deeper examination of the drinking of beer and the brewing of beer in Mesopotamia. We'll then finish up with a look at efforts to recreate ancient beverages, including one that I've been involved with myself. Okay, let's jump right in. First, Mesopotamia. Where exactly are we in space and time? In terms of geography, we're talking about a region that extends across parts of modern day Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. We call this region, highlighted here in orange, Mesopotamia, Greek for between the rivers. Time-wise, time we'll tread briefly into earlier territory, but our focus will be the period from about 4,000 to 300 BCE. This 4,000-year span marks the heyday of Mesopotamian civilization, a civilization that the Gettys exhibition explores via three intertwined themes. First writing, first cities, and first kingdoms. Indeed, during this time frame, the region witnessed a series of momentous developments. Uh, a series of firsts on the world historical stage. The world's first system of written language, known as cuneiform or wedge-shaped, after the distinctive wedge-shaped signs that early scribes imp impressed into clay tablets. The world's first cities, most famously the early city of Uruk, but the urbanization process left in its wake uh, a landscape packed full of cities, and Mesopotamia remained a thoroughly urban civilization for several thousand years. And then finally, the world's first kingdoms, that is what we would often call states, more or less centralized political entities, in this case under the leadership of a king whose authority was ultimately granted by the gods. Our question for today is, what does beer have to do with all this? The short answer, a lot. I wouldn't be so bold as to claim that beer was the driving force behind any of these developments, but it was no bit player either. 
I'm going to draw today on three main types of evidence, archaeological, written, and art historical. Though these are not actually completely separate categories, there's plenty of overlap. For example, an archaeologist might dig up a clay tablet covered in cuneiform writing. This tablet is a piece of archaeological evidence, an artifact whose interpretation will depend on exactly where it was found, its archaeological context. But it's also a written document, a text composed in Sumerian, Akkadian, or one of the other languages in use at the time. And if, as in many cases, that text was authenticated by rolling a cylinder seal across the wet clay, leaving behind the image that had once been carved into the seal, then it's also a piece of art historical evidence. So let's just talk very quickly about these three types of evidence. First, archaeological. Archaeologists study the physical remains of the past. All that stuff, objects, buildings, burials, food remains, etc., that was left behind and has somehow managed to survive into the present day. We can draw on a long history, about a century and a half, of archaeological research in Mesopotamia, some of it little better than glorified treasure hunting, but much of it of a high scientific standard. Archaeologists have examined hundreds of sites across the region, either through excavation or through non-destructive means, what we often call archaeological survey. So we know a lot about the physical traces of ancient Mesopotamia, but there's still enormous scope for further work, and archaeological teams from all over the world are hard at work on this as we speak, at least as far as possible given the global pandemic and the ongoing, ongoing conflict in Syria. Now here you see an image from the city of Ur, where excavations in the 1920s and 30s uncovered several different parts of the city, residential neighborhoods, cemeteries, a monumental temple, precinct, etc. Uh, and then you see two types of artifact, both from Ur, that we'll be returning to again and again today, ceramic vessels and a cylinder seal. Ceramics were produced in huge numbers in ancient Mesopotamia and preserved very well in the archaeological record. They're one of our main lines of evidence, in a general sense, but they're also particularly valuable when it comes to the study of beer. Beer is a liquid, after all, and ceramics are ideally suited to serving as containers for liquids. The cylinder seal is one of the most recognizable artifact ty types from ancient Mesopotamia. These small stone cylinders were carved with intricate designs, sometimes abstract patterns, but very often scenes of one kind or another, and often alongside a brief cuneiform inscription. When rolled in wet clay, the seal would leave behind a reverse image of the inscribed scene, what we call a seal impression. Here you see a seal from Ur and a modern impression made using that seal. As you can hopefully see, the impression reveals a banquet scene in two registers. This particular seal was found in one of the most famous tombs at Ur, right by the side of the main occupant of the tomb, Queen Puabi. We'll see some more seals in a few minutes, uh, and we'll also see some other artistic media. For example, stone plaques carved with relief scenes and molded clay plaques bearing images in raised relief. So what about written evidence? Here, sticking with our focus on the city of Ur, you see three different cuneiform tablets, all excavated at Ur, but dating to very different time periods. The cuneiform writing system was invented in Mesopotamia around 3200 BCE. At first, it was used almost entirely for administrative purposes, that is, accounting documents of one sort or another, alongside so-called lexical texts, basically thematically organized lists of cuneiform signs. Over the ensuing centuries, the cuneiform script was gradually recruited to record more and more different kinds of text. Legal documents, royal inscriptions, literature, law codes, letters, omen lists, medical texts, etc. Uh, and the script itself evolved over time, for example, becoming more and more abstract. Hundreds of thousands of these cuneiform tablets have been uncovered to date, and many more await discovery. They're an amazing resource, and as we'll see, they have a lot to say about beer. So what exactly do we know about beer in Mesopotamia? At the moment, the very earliest days of beer in the region remain pretty hazy. Very hazy, in fact. Uh, but thanks especially to recent advances in organic residue analysis, that is, analysis of actual physical traces of ancient beverages, new data about the world's earliest alcoholic beverages are coming out fast and furious these days. Uh, we can absolutely expect some significant new insight in the coming years. But we can't talk about the origins of beer in the region without at least mentioning the uh, infamous and often overhyped bread versus beer debate. Uh, back in the 50s, a group of scholars famously debated the question, did man, that is humans, once live by beer alone? 
In other words, is it possible that cereal grains were domesticated in Southwest Asia not to serve as a source of food, but as a source of drink? We're no closer to a definitive answer now than they were back then, uh, but this old chestnut regularly rears its head once again in the academic literature. For example, the excavators of the site of Gubekli Tepe in southeastern Turkey have put together a compelling defense of the beer first position, supported by some tantalizing but inconclusive evidence for residues of beer preserved within a series of stone basins. They argue that the domestication of barley may have been driven, ultimately, by a combination of increasingly elaborate ritual practices and a thirst for beer. Groups of widely dispersed mobile hunter-gatherers appear to have been coming together periodically at this site to construct monumental and elaborately decorated ritual structures, and also to hold big feasts, well provisioned with the liberal supply of meat and possibly beer. Indeed, uh, they argue that these feasts were a means of mobilizing and motivating the labor needed to construct the ritual structures. And they argue that an escalating desire for beer may have put pressure on the wild grain resources in the surrounding area, kicking off the domestication process. So we've got some very early hints of beer in the region, but these are followed by a conspicuous beer-free gap of about four to 5,000 years. This gap is probably an illusion. It's almost certainly gonna be filled in gradually with new evidence. But it's only in the fourth millennium BCE that we get our first really solid evidence for beer in Mesopotamia. This comes in two forms. First, actual physical traces of the beer itself, preserved as residue inside a ceramic vessel at the site of Godin Tepe in Western Iran. And second, written documents. When those first intrepid scribes in the city of Uruk started putting pen to paper, well, stylus to clay, what do you think was on their minds? Great works of oral literature that could finally be recorded for posterity now? Uh, deep philosophical thoughts? Love poems? Nope, beer. They were thinking about beer. At least that was one of the things they were thinking about. Most of the so-called archaic texts written in the proto-cuneiform script were economic documents. Uh, and beer was a valued commodity, something worth keeping careful tabs on. So beer is all over the place in these early documents. Here you see an accounting document dating to about 3000 BCE. And look at all this beer. Each of the signs circled here depicts a jar of a particular type of beer. And to the left of each, you see a numerical notation indicating the number of jars. This document is a record of beer deliveries or distributions, basically saying this many jars of this type of beer and this many jars of this other type of beer, etc., were delivered to the following person, and then this many to these other people. On the right side, I've shown you what these beer jar signs look like when they're flipped 90 degrees. Uh, hopefully it's a little clearer this way that each one is actually a depiction of a beer jar, either with a pointed or a rounded base, and with some other markings inside to distinguish the different types of beer. So that's the earliest evidence for beer in Mesopotamia. Let's talk for a minute about the beer itself. Exactly what kind of beer are we talking about here? What exactly was this beverage known as kash in the Sumerian language or shikaru in Akkadian? In the most general sense, we're dealing with a barley-based fermented beverage built on a backbone of malted barley. In this respect, Mesopotamian beer was like the beers that many of us are most familiar with today. I hasten to add though, that the world of beer, both past and present, is extremely diverse and includes a host of brewing traditions built around other grains, maize, millet, sorghum, rice, etc. Cuneiform documents refer to a variety of different types of beer. For example, in the earliest texts, which we just saw an example of, nine different types are mentioned, but are difficult to translate. Here you see the corresponding proto-cuneiform signs. If we fast forward to about 2500 BCE, at least five types were recognized. Golden, dark, sweet dark, red, and strained or filtered. Here you see an example of the kind of ceramic strainer or filter that archeologists uncover all the time in the region, uh, though we don't know that these were used specifically for beer. By about 2100 BCE then, beer was being categorized primarily in terms of its quality or strength, ordinary, good, and very good, or perhaps ordinary, strong, and very strong. There's actually significant disagreement about the alcohol content of Mesopotamian beer. Some, for example, have taken the fact that children sometimes drank beer or that people drank beer at work as a sign that the beer was low or very low in alcohol content, perhaps not even really beer at all. 
here you see a pretty extreme version of that argument. Um, I think it's definitely possible that the Sumerian and Akkadian terms that we translate as beer could have included beverages that we wouldn't necessarily consider beer. But I'm skeptical of the suggestion that these beverages were, across the board, low in alcohol content. This offers us a nice transition into the topic of drinking. What exactly do we know about the drinking of beer in Mesopotamia? Let's talk briefly about the evidence for drinking in the written record, the artistic record, and the archaeological record. First off, why did people drink beer? Was it primarily a form of liquid bread, a form of sustenance? The answer is yes, but also no. Beer certainly did occupy an important position in the diet, but it was not a generic foodstuff. It was a special beverage that was recognized to produce distinctive effects on imbibers. Our best evidence here comes from Mesopotamian literature, where the gods, for example, are regularly depicted drinking beer and feeling the effects. Sometimes beer made people happy. It lightened their mood. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, for example, after Enkidu drank seven, drank seven goblets of beer, his mood became free, he started to sing, his heart grew merry, his face lit up. Likewise, in the Epic of Creation, or Enuma Elish, the gods sat down at a feast. They felt good from drinking the beer, most carefree, their spirits rose. And sometimes beer riled people up. It was beer and wine, for example, that launched grain and sheep into a heated debate about which of the two was superior. When they had drunk sweet wine and enjoyed sweet beer, they started a quarrel. And it was beer that inspired the goddess Ninmah to challenge the god Inki to a battle of wits, a competition over which of the two could more effectively find an appropriate place in society for humans born with various disabilities. In the end, the goddess was no match for the clever Inki, and what started out as a friendly competition ended in despair for one and triumph for the other. So excessive beer consumption could stir up rivalry and lead to hurt feelings, also poor decisions and regret. In a tale known as in Inanna and Inki, for example, the two deities get a little tipsy and the tables are turned on Inki. While he's feeling the effects of the beer, he gives Inanna control over a whole series of divine powers that were in his possession. When the effects wear off, Inki desperately asks his minister Izimud where all his powers have gone. The answer? My master has given them to his daughter. And just to hammer home this point about the negative effects of beer, we even have a tale about a man who comes home drunk and is unable to please his wife in bed. So the drinking of beer was recognized to produce some distinctive effects on drinkers, effects that we would call inebriation. How then did one get one's hands on this beverage? In at least some cases, it was doled out as rations. For example, the text that you see here documents the distribution of beer to three builders engaged in work at the town of Garshana. And here you see the eminently unadorned and notoriously unattractive beveled rim bowl. These mass-produced vessels have often been interpreted as ration bowls. Some have even suggested that they might have once contained beer rationed, but the jury is very much out on that one. So beer was sometimes consumed on the job. It was also consumed at home, in the palace, in the temple, at all manner of feasts, festivals, and ceremonies. And it was consumed in neighborhood taverns. The famous Code of Hammurabi, for example, includes a number of laws that reference taverns. Here you see one describing the punishment if the tavern keeper will only accept silver rather than grain in exchange for beer, she'll be cast into the water. Uh, one specifying the return in grain on a vat of beer loaned by a tavern keeper. And one defining the punishment, death, if she does not report and seize any criminals congregating in her establishment. The upshot is, beer was absolutely ubiquitous in Mesopotamia. So what can we say about drinking practices, that is, about their preferred mode and manner of imbibing? Are we talking a discreet pint now and then among friends? A daily routine interspersed with moderate but more or less continuous drinking? A drinking regimen that was restricted to periodic special events where beer flowed freely but was bound up with an elaborate drinking etiquette and fancy drinking paraphernalia? Or are we talking frat parties, kegs, and beer bongs? Here I'm showing you one of the classic depictions of beer consumption in the artistic record. On this cylinder seal, in the upper register, you can see two people seated on either side of a large vessel. And then you see two straws emerging from the top of the vessel. In Mesopotamia, as in many parts of the world today, beer was often consumed from a communal vessel through long reed straws. 
When cups or bowls are shown, rather than straws, it's more difficult to be certain that we're dealing with beer as opposed to some other beverage. But banquet scenes like this give us a good visual sense for one of the contexts in which beer was regularly consumed in Mesopotamia. It's crucial, though, to bear in mind that these offer a very restricted window onto a particular kind of elite drinking practice, where members of the upper crust sit stiffly and primly on fancy furniture, are waited on by servants, entertained by musicians, etc. I can't resist showing you one other kind of scene that, once again, shows the drinking of beer through a straw, but in a different, in a different sort of a context. Um, I'm not going to describe it in detail here, but the scene involves a woman who is bent over drinking beer through a straw from a vessel that sits on the floor, and then there's a man behind her. These so-called erotic drinking scenes are actually pretty common. Uh, during her dissertation, dissertation research at the site of Hamukar in Syria, for example, my wife, Kate Grossman, uncovered a sort of stick figure version of this scene on a cylinder seal. The seal was found in a burial and appears to have originally been suspended on a necklace. Given the regular association between taverns and prostitution, it's often speculated that these images might offer a glimpse into tavern life, but we don't really know. The archaeological record can also provide insight into drinking practices, especially when it comes to drinking equipment. For example, excavations have uncovered all kinds of ceramic vessels whose forms suggest that they were used for the serving or drinking of liquids. Until recently, there's been little means of ferreting out exactly what kind of liquid, beer, wine, water, who knows, but organic residue analysis is changing that. The excavators of the site of Kanimasi in Iraq, for example, have recently used residue analysis to show that beer was once consumed from a series of different types of vessel, broadly similar to those that you see here. And they've interpreted one particular room whose floor was littered with these vessels as a space for communal beer consumption. Drinking paraphernalia also shows up in the realm of funerary ritual. As in many other parts of the world, the people of ancient Mesopotamia, and especially people of wealth and status, were often laid to rest surrounded by all the trappings of a well-stocked party. In some cases, many of the burial goods uncovered by archaeologists probably were the remnants of an actual funerary feast. That is, a send-off party of sorts where attendees were treated to food and drink. At the site of Abu Salabik, for example, many graves dating to the early dynastic period included an array of conical bowls for food or drink consumption, alongside spouted jars for serving liquids. Here you see a particularly prolific example. Grave 1 included 109 conical bowls, 27 spouted jars, and a so-called four-part set that we'll return to in a moment. Although there's no residue analysis for confirmation, it's likely that these vessels were employed in a well-attended graveside feast or some other funerary ritual involving alcoholic beverages. At the top is a drawing, looking down from above, that shows the exact position of all the vessels within the burial. And at the bottom is a photo that shows a sample of these vessels. Before we leave the topic of drinking, I want to say a little something about the politics of beer. As we've seen, from the 4th millennium BCE onward, the political landscape in Mesopotamia was increasingly dominated by centralized systems of governments that we now call states. And these states were heavily invested in the production, distribution, and ultimately, consumption of beer. So the first kingdoms highlighted in the Getty exhibition were built, at least in part, on beer. Exactly what beer was doing for these early kingdoms is, I think, a question that still needs further consideration. In a recent article, for example, I've argued that the discussion of beer and politics in Mesopotamia and beyond has tended to sidestep the issue of inebriation. As we've seen, the people of Mesopotamia recognized, and indeed valued, the inebriating potential of beer. But this side of beer consumption tends to fade into the background when we start talking about the political utility of beer. So I've been trying to think about how we can take the inebriating effects of beer consumption more seriously as a force in the political realm. There's no question, though, that beer and politics were intimately intertwined. Susan Pollock, for example, has argued that elite feasting practices, those feasts that we'd see depicted in the artistic record, played a key role in the process of state formation. That is, in the construction of these new, centralized political systems dominated by a restricted inner circle of movers and shakers. According to her argument, formalized, exclusive feasting events helped separate this newly emergent elite 
off from the rabble. And representation of the feasting events in visual media, intended primarily for their own eyes, helped cement their new identity in a kind of self-indoctrination. Kingship and beer also went hand in hand. Pyotr Mikulovsky, for example, has highlighted a series of documents that refer to high-status gift-giving ceremonies during which the king, quote, drank beer in the house of so-and-so. So these, again, highly exclusive events that helped tie the ruling regime to its elite supporters were basically couched as social visits defined by the drinking of beer. Okay, let's shift gears now and talk about the brewing of beer. First, the who and the where. Throughout Mesopotamian history, brewers, typically men and typically employed by the palace and temple institutions, appear regularly in the cuneiform record. Here you see a cylinder seal that probably once belonged to a brewer. The inscription at the top reads, Urzu the brewer, and the scene at the bottom right seems to depict the brewer at work. Brewers worked at a place called the Eilunga, that is the house of the brewer or brewery, a facility where beer was produced in relatively large quantities. Accounting documents have a lot to say about the delivery of ingredients to these breweries and about the uh, distribution of the finished product, but very little to say about breweries as physical spaces or about the activities that took place within. Breweries have proven difficult to identify in the archaeological record, but a few potential candidates have been proposed. The best comes from the site of Tel al-Hibba in Iraq, the ancient city of Lagash. The other occupation associated closely with brewing was the tavern keeper, whom we've already met in the Code of Hammurabi. This profession appears to have been dominated by women. Taverns and their proprietors appear rather infrequently in the written record, but we know that taverns were places of drinking and carousal and were often linked with prostitution. And we know that tavern keepers sometimes fed brewing byproducts to pigs, which, which suggests that beer was being brewed on premises. Unfortunately, the written record has little to say about home brewing, but occasional hints suggest that it was common and probably conducted primarily by women. A few documents, for example, suggest that women sometimes brought brewing vessels with them into marriage as part of their dowry. And we have some great archeological evidence for home brewing from the site of Telbazi in Syria. Among approximately 50 houses excavated at the site, many contained evidence for a standardized set of ceramic vessels whose use for the brewing of beer and sometimes wine has been confirmed by residue analysis. The excavators have argued, in fact, that nearly every household at Tel Bazi was producing its own beer or wine. Now let's talk briefly about brewing ingredients, brewing equipment, and the brewing process. We don't have any recipes for beer in Mesopotamia, but breweries had to keep careful tabs on their inputs and outputs. That is, the brewing ingredients that they received and the beer that they produced using these ingredients. So we do have documents that list the ingredients used to brew particular batches of beer. Here you see that same early proto-cuneiform tablet that I showed you earlier. The front side of the tablet on the left tabulates the number of jars of four different types of beer distributed to particular people and for particular occasions. The separate deliveries are highlighted here in green. Backside on the right then tallies up the brewing ingredients that were used to brew all that beer. In the middle, in red, you get the total number of jars of the four different types of beer. On the right, in blue, you get the barley groats and the malt needed to brew each of those jar totals by beer type. Then on the left, in yellow, you get the total barley groats and malt needed for all of the jars combined. Moving a bit later in time, here you see an account from the city of Girsu documenting the quantities of ingredients used to brew two batches of golden beer, each batch totaling about 45 liters. So, golden beer was brewed with emmer wheat, malted barley, and a special product known as bapir. This grain bill contrasts with some of the other beer styles that appear in similar records from Girsu, for example, dark beer and sweet dark beer. We've learned about ingredients partly from texts like these, but the effort to understand exactly what these ingredients were uh, requires engagement with a much broader range of source material. This is an ongoing effort and one that Assyriologists, that is specialists in the languages of ancient Mesopotamia, have been working on for a long time. But what can we say in a very general sense about the ingredients used? Here's a list of the basics. First, as we already saw, these beers were built on a base of malted barley. 
that is barley that's been allowed to germinate, and start the process of breaking the starches and the grain down into fermentable sugars. The second key ingredient was known as bapir in Sumerian. Bapir seems to have been some kind of crumbly bread or cake, one that could be dried out and stored for later use, but there's a lot of disagreement about exactly what it was and where it would have fit into the brewing process. Some have argued that bapir was not a bread at all, but rather some kind of roasted barley product. Others have envisioned something akin to biscotti. Personally, uh, I find interpretations of bapir as something like a dried out cake of sourdough starter uh, more compelling. Something like these cakes of nuruk that you see here, a fermentation starter used today in Korea. You might notice one key ingredient that doesn't appear on my list, yeast. This is a big question mark. We don't know how Mesopotamian brewers were getting the fermentation process started. For example, whether they were just relying on naturally occurring airborne yeasts, dregs from a previous batch of beer, or something else. But there's a distinct possibility that bapir was actually the yeast source. Some unmalted or raw grains were used as adjuncts in Mesopotamian beers, especially barley and emmer wheat. And there's good reason to suspect that some roasted, toasted, or otherwise modified grain products were employed. For example, possibly some whose preparation involved a separate fermentation stage of some kind. And date syrup, the primary sweetener in ancient Mesopotamia, was definitely added to some beers, but it's not clear exactly when this syrup would have been added. For example, was it added early in the brewing process to boost the concentration of fermentable sugars, and therefore the alcohol content of the final product, or it was, added, was it added later as a sweetener? And then finally, there's the frustrating category of so-called aromatics, additional flavorings that were added to beer. We ne know next to nothing about these. Uh, here I've listed some possibilities that were available and used for other culinary purposes in Mesopotamia. Um, note though that hops, an essential component of many beers today, do not appear on this list. Okay, uh, now let's talk briefly about brewing equipment. Lots of brewing vessels and other equipment make an appearance in cuneiform documents. For example, here you see the first stanza from a drinking song that begins by heaping praise on a series of vessels used in brewing and beer consumption. The gakul vat, which makes the liver happy. The lamsa re vat, which rejoices the heart. The ugur bal jar, a fitting thing in the house. The sagub jar, which is filled with beer. And the am am jar, which carries the beer of the lamsa re vat. These beautiful vessels are ready on their pot stands. One big challenge though, is figuring out exactly what these vessels might have looked like and how they might match up with the ceramic vessels recovered at archeological sites. For example, in cuneiform documents, brewing vessels uh, regularly appear together in pairs. The gakul with the lamsa re, the nigdurbur and the lachtan, the namzitu with the namharu. Uh, indeed, these seem to have actually functioned as a pair with one pierced with a hole in the base sitting above the other. And they're sometimes said to have talked with one another, making a double double, double double sound, presumably the sound of liquid dripping or pouring from one to the other. They're often interpreted as a fermentation or filtering vessel, which sat above a collecting vessel, although we actually have a poor understanding of how they fit into the brewing process. For archeologists though, one detail here is crucial the hole pierced in the base of the upper vessel. This is something that we can easily identify and many excavated examples are known. I'm showing you three examples uh, from the site of Tel Asmar in Iraq. In fact, organic residue analysis at the sites of Tel Bazi in Syria and Kani Masi in Iraq has revealed traces of beer within vessels just like these and also in some other vessels that were found in association with them. So we're starting to get some preliminary sense for what a typical set of brewing vessels might have looked like. There's also another really intriguing set of vessels, the so-called four-part set, that's been found in a series of burials dating to the third millennium BCE. The typical set includes a flat-bottomed cup, a strainer or bowl with pierced base, um, a cylindrical colander, and a large open vat. It's possible that these vessels were used in either the brewing or consumption of beer, but this remains an open question. Of course, brewing would also have required other equipment and installations beyond vessels. My wife, for example, has argued that a series of fire installations at the site of Hamukar in Syria might have been employed in the production of malted barley for brewing. 
Each had a thick plaster floor that had been heavily burnt and was surrounded by a semicircular course of mud bricks, possibly the lowest course of what was originally a dome. She argues that these constructions might have been used for drying or roasting malted barley, uh, and indeed several burnt grains were found sitting on the plaster floors. She goes even further to suggest that the whole surrounding complex might have been a brewery, but this interpretation remains tentative. So, as you can probably tell, when it comes to specifying exactly which equipment was used to brew beer, we're still finding our way. There's a lot of uncertainty. But getting a better handle on the archaeological evidence for brewing and drinking uh, is really our best means of putting beer back into the urban landscape. That is, figuring out uh, what beer was doing in those first cities explored in the Getty exhibition. It's also our best means of developing a more bottom-up, a more democratic perspective on beer, one that gives all brewers and beer drinkers equal say. When we rely on written evidence and artistic evidence, we see beer primarily through the eyes of the institutional administrator, the court scribe, the producer and consumer of elite craft goods. When we focus instead on the broader range of stuff that people left behind, the remains of their houses, their trash dumps, the material goods that they used on a daily basis, this opens up the possibility of saying something about a much larger slice of the population. Okay, so that's brewing ingredients and brewing equipment. How do they actually brew the beer? Well, this is a tough question. Um, one of the only descriptions of the brewing process comes from a literary text, the famous Himten in Kasi, goddess of beer. Whatever you might have heard, if you have heard anything about this document, this is most definitely not a recipe for the brewing of beer. It's a poem or song that praises the goddess, and in the process, seems to provide a very rough and flowery description of the brewing process, at least sort of arranged um, in a step-by-step -step fashion. And it always appears alongside the drinking song that we saw just a minute ago. Let's just look at a few selected verses to give you a sense for the flavor of this document. Ninkasi, you are the one who bakes the bapir in a big oven, puts in order the hot pulp, hmm, excuse me, puts in order the piles of hulled grain. Ninkasi, you are the one who soaks the malt in a jar. The waves rise, the waves fall. Ninkasi, the fermenting vat, which makes a pleasant sound, you place appropriately on top of a large collector vat. Ninkasi, you are the one who pours out the filtered beer of the collector vat. It's like the onrush of the Tigris and the Euphrates. There's a lot of room for disagreement over how one translates and interprets this hymn. Here I just want to take you quickly through a recent effort by Walter Salaberger to diagram out the brewing process, drawing on his own updated translation of the hymn. On the left, you'll see a big picture summary of the key steps in the process, and on the right, a more detailed breakdown, based on my rough translation of his chart, which was published in German. First, there's the preparation of the two key ingredients. On the left, bapir, which involves grinding barley, mixing it with a sourdough starter, allowing this to ferment, and then baking or drying it. And on the right, malted barley, which involves germinating the barley, halting the germination, and then grinding or crushing it. Then there's a mashing stage where the bapir and the malt are independently mixed with water and allowed to steep. This is followed by an initial fermentation stage where the two mashes um, are mixed together and allowed to ferment. The result is a sort of intermediate product that can be dried out and stored for later use. There's then a final fermentation where this intermediate product is mixed with water and allowed to ferment into beer for drinking. Again, this is just one hypothetical scenario. Um, I know there's a lot going on here in this chart, but hopefully it gives you some sense for what the brewing process might have looked like. One way to test out interpretations like this is to actually put them into practice. That is, to actually brew some beer. This kind of effort to recreate ancient beer falls under the broader rubric of what we call experimental archaeology. In their efforts to interpret the remains that they uncover, archaeologists regularly try to replicate particular activities from the past. For example, making pottery, using stone tools, or brewing beer. Approaches to this experimental archaeology run the gamut from those that cleave very closely to the archaeological evidence and emphasize scientific rigor to looser, more exploratory efforts. In a general sense, though, what's the point? Why go to the trouble? 
Sometimes the goal is to better understand what kind of traces the activity in question might leave in the archaeological record, or to investigate competing hypotheses regarding the use of particular artifacts. Very seldom, though, does experimental archaeology provide definitive answers. It's a tool for exploring possibilities, generating questions, calling attention to blind spots in our interpretations. And sometimes it's really more about the experience itself, about getting a feeling for what, what it might have been like for the people involved, developing an embodied sensorial connection with the past. But here we're treading into a realm um, that's sometimes called experiential archaeology. I bring this up because I think many efforts to replicate ancient beverages fall somewhere around the intersection between the experimental and the experiential, um, especially when these experiments culminate in beverage consumption, as they generally do. Given that the end point, when things go according to plan, is alcohol for drinking, it's perhaps not surprising that there have been many efforts to recreate ancient beverages. And increasingly, one explicit goal is to bring these beverages to a curious and thirsty public. You might, for example, have seen or tasted some of the results of a long-running collaboration between archaeologist Pat McGovern and Dogfish Head Brewing. Um, drawing on the results of organic residue analysis, they've produced a whole series of experimental brews and have bottled and distributed these widely. Over the years, a number of different groups have specifically sought to recreate the beers of ancient Mesopotamia. Here, for example, you're seeing some shots from a collaboration between the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago and Anchor Brewing in the late 80s. As you can see, they're using modern brewing equipment rather than trying to recreate ancient brewing equipment. More recently, the excavators of the site of Talbazi in Syria have also brewed their own beer, but using more traditional equipment. I've also been involved with an experimental brewing effort that brought together scholars from the University of Chicago's Oriental Institute where I was a grad student, and brewers from Great Lakes Brewing Company in Cleveland. In this case, the goal was, as far as possible, to recreate the brewing process in Mesopotamia using authentic ingredients, technologies, and techniques. Here you see our set of brewing vessels, all replicas based on actual vessels excavated by the Oriental Institute at archaeological sites in Iraq, except the big metal one in the back, of course. And here are some shots of our experiments. Um, as we've seen, there's a lot that we don't know about Mesopotamian brewing, so an effort like this requires a lot of educated guesswork. Given all this uncertainty, what do we get out of these brewing experiments? For me, ultimately, it's all about the questions that are generated. When we attempt to put something like this into practice, we're forced to confront a whole range of uncertainties and gaps in our knowledge, things that we almost certainly would not have considered or might have ignored otherwise. So this is not about generating a perfect replica of any particular ancient Mesopotamian beer. Ours almost certainly uh, were not a, a perfect replica. It's about coming at the evidence from a different angle, engaging with the interpretive process in a hands-on fashion, and doing it alongside brewers who add their own forms of knowledge and expertise into the mix. This close collaboration with the brewers has really been one of the most rewarding parts of the project. And then there's the beer itself. At this point, we've let quite a few people sample the fruits of our labor. Um, so far, we've held a series of six tasting events in various cities. Here you see one of the beers that we made, christened Inky Brew, to go along with Gilgamesh, a beer made using the same ingredients, but modern brewing equipment. Here you see the two side by side. The Inky Brew varied pretty significantly from batch to batch, but it ranged in alcohol content from about three to 8%. It was uncarbonated, often milky looking and on the sour side. We flavored it with a shifting mixture of coriander, cardamom, fennel, dates, and juniper berries. Uh, and we experimented with adding date syrup, both before and after fermentation, adding it before up to the ABV, while adding it later, right before handing it out to tasters, resulted in a sweet, some might say cloying, beverage that was generally not a crowd favorite. The Gilgamesh was brewed on modern equi brewing equipment using the same ingredients, uh, except on the bapir front. For the Inky Brew, the bapir, a dried out cake of sourdough, served as our yeast source. For the Gilgamesh, we relied on one of Great Lakes' own strains of yeast. So this beer was much more familiar. Carbonated, somewhere in the vicinity of a Cezanne, but with some interesting elements coming from the herbs and spices that were added, and the date syrup. I will say that usually about half of our tasters preferred the Inky Brew, so don't let anyone tell you that Mesopotamian beer would have been nasty. 
They love their beer, and many of us might have too. And of course, we always let everyone try the Inky Brew through straws from a communal pot, usually reed straws, but in this case, fluorescent plastic. Um, I think that's all I have to say for now. Uh, thanks again for joining in today, and I'll do my best to answer any questions that you might have. Hi, Tate. Hello. Thank you for that. I have a question to start out about drinking from the long straws. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming plastic isn't quite like a reed, um, but if could you describe what it is like as a communal experience to sit around a big vat and drink like that? Do you think <laughs> that was a, a meaningful aspect of the communication around? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, uh, so one one thing to just emphasize is that this is actually still a really common practice in many places. Um, it's kind of lots of people sitting around a central vessel drinking through um, long straws and often reed straws. Um, my, my first thought there is that when we did our first tasting event after making our experimental beers, um, we sort of, we, we thought, is there, is anyone going to actually do this if we try to, if we let them drink out of the straws? And we really didn't think so. We thought, I don't know, people are going to be worried about sanitation and things like that. But we thought maybe just like a few intrepid people are going to try this. So we put it up there. And immediately, as soon as we were, we finished the, my talk, everyone just swarmed up there to try it that way. And so I think the immediate answer is yes, it's a really fun communal experience that's very different than a lot of, you know, how we drink a lot of beverages um, uh, today. And my, my one other thought, I mean, my own just sort of personal experience of it, and I think talking to some other people also, is that you sort of, the alcohol kind of hits you a little differently. Um, you know, sort of taking a sip versus um, through a straw and also the sort of sensory experience is a little different. You know, you're not, you're, you're not smelling it and things in quite the same way. I mean, you are, we, we had sort of short straws sometimes, so you had to kind of lean over the, the pot. But if you're sort of sitting back from the pot with the straw, it's, it's, a, it's a very different kind of experience in that way too. Does that sort of answer your question? It does. I, I wonder if trying a straw in your beer bottle, it, uh, would have any kind of similar effect, but it would be worth it for all of you at home who are trying a brew. <laughs> yeah, definitely go for it. Strangely, I'm not sure that I've ever tried just sticking a straw into my own beer. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound very communally nice, but I guess we can't recommend that people hover around <laughs> a communal vessel right now. Maybe not right now, yeah. There are some questions that are overlapping that are interesting and um, Christopher and Tom and Edward and Matthew in different ways have all mentioned the concern about um, disease, water in water, and the possibility that regulating heat would have an effect and that the alcohol itself would be part of that regulation. Yeah, uh, these are, yeah, these are a lot of interesting questions. I'll see if I can sort of find where they kind of intersect here. Um, the question about the, was, was beer, for example, in this region invented as a means of um, helping essentially purify drinking water? Um, the answer is, well, we don't know. <laughs> um, so, and it's a, this is a, a topic that I'm really interested in. I, I think there are some indications in texts that there was a recognition that, just some at least, that beer might have been safer to drink um, than water but it's not a major theme or something like that. And this is actually something that I'm working with uh, some colleagues at NC State right now, just to sort of test, um, test the, pos the degree to which this is really the case. Um, strangely, it seems like a question that hasn't received all that much experimental attention. Um, and for instance, the difference between, is it the fermentation process that does the, that sort of makes it safer to drink potentially, or can you basically add alcohol to water, um, you know, separately brewed alcohol to water and that that also helps, it makes it safer to drink. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting question. The question, and we don't know the answer, the question about how is this related to the origins of beer is even harder. Um, you know, when we get back into, as, as I hope was clear, um, by the time we get our really good evidence for beer in this region, it's already almost certainly been around for thousands of years. So it's already a well-developed tradition and we're only getting little hints about those 
earliest days of beer. And, um, you know, it, we'd have to come up with very sort of creative ways to make the, that kind of argument using just archeological evidence. That is to, ar to, to argue about the motivation um, for developing beer. Um, I mentioned this site of Gubekli Tepe where the excavators, they've made an, an interesting argument that proceeds very carefully through a series of steps to try to argue that the motivation, not just for, um, for beer, but for the domestication of grain in this region might actually have been related to the sort of inebriating side of beer, which is a shift from um, sort of common assumptions before um, when talking about domestication and that kind of thing. But so the answer is it's, it's a great question, but it would take some really um, sort of creative argumentation to figure out how to address it. Did I, were there some other elements of that, that question that I didn't touch on there? No, I think, I think you got it. I mean, basically we, so many times we don't know and designing the right, yeah. the right way to find out involves. You're going to hear that. You're, you're almost certainly going to hear that from me a lot. I, uh, when, when we would do these tasting events with Great Lakes Brewing, um, the owner there, Pat Conway, who was really heavily involved, he always liked to make fun of me, uh, you know, when he was speaking in front of everyone that my, definitely my most common answer to their questions is, I don't know. And, you know, that's, that's true. <laughs> that means you're an honest archaeologist. <laughs> right. Well, sort of on that, on that note, um, Deborah's um, wondering about, no, that's not that note. Sorry. Uh, I'll get back to you, Deborah. Uh, Dorothy's wondering about how we can be sure what the jars and containers contained and why yeah. do we call it beer? I mean, I'm adding that part. How do we know to call it beer and why do we no. Yeah, I mean, these are very complicated questions. And in, in some ways, they're, they're philological questions, which is they're, they're very much related to the study of the languages, you know, and the, the signs used to write these languages, which is a little beyond, well beyond my own expertise as an archaeologist. But um, I guess the answer there is partly that, um, and, you know, I, sh I showed some examples of this, is that and I, I, I can't really go into great depth about the process of deciphering these languages, which is, was a very difficult process that's still ongoing. Sumerian, for example, is, on, is, is only imperfectly understood still as a language. Um, but the, the, you know, some of these earliest documents, I think when this question was asked, you were talking about those, some of those proto-cuneiform documents that have the little pictures of a jar of beer, uh, basically. How do we know that it's beer? in there rather than tea or something else. And part of the answer is because some of those documents talk about the ingredients that were used to make it. Um, and so at the least, we can say that it was made um, with malted barley and probably ground barley. Um, that doesn't indicate um, an alcoholic component necessarily. Um, and I don't think in those earliest texts, there's any real way at the moment to get at that, but the same the signs that are introduced in those early texts and the words and things, we can sort of follow those as they evolve through time um, in various ways into the words where we can be more certain that they're, you know, they're talking about um, beer specifically and not just a barley based um, beverage, but one that at least sometimes leads to inebriation. That how to answer that. <laughs> yes, it does. And it's also, you're going to get questions that are huge <laughs> and that nobody can answer without a coterie of uh, specialists around. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dorothy was wondering, uh, sorry, back to Deborah. Deborah was wondering about the ounces of beer in person. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I saw this. So I think that that was when I showed a picture of some vessels from, uh, well, I was talking about some vessels from the site of Kani Masi in Iraq, where there were some, a series of goblets on the screen. Um, the, 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 the vessels from that particular site that I was talking about, um, I believe they had sort of two size ranges that they, that, that specific, that had evidence for beer associated with them, residue evidence. Um, the smaller ones, let's see, were, um, like 100 to 200 milliliters, which is, um, it's pretty small. That's about like three to six, seven ounces something like that. And the, um, the larger ones were about 300 to 600 milliliters, which is something like 10 to 20 ounces. Um, and then um, I, I haven't gone through and looked at you know, lots of other studies that you know, have sort of 
looked at specific kinds of vessels um, to sort of see that size range. I, uh, and because the residue analysis is only, um, has only come out pretty recently, we don't have very many cases where we have sort of smoking gun evidence that these specific vessels were used to drink beer, you know, or, or sort of beer goblets. Um, there was another recent argument that examined a specific type of vessel called, um, called a solid footed goblet from the early dynastic period, which we don't have that kind of residue analysis for these, but you can at least make a reasonable argument that they might have been used for drinking beer. Um, and those were um, on sort of on average looking across Mesopotamian sites in that period, um, about uh, 0.17 liters um, in size, which is just under a half pint, something like that. So um, that's just sort of these, these sort of three types of vessels. Um, and we're just starting to get a handle on this. It's really only recently that we could say specifically that yes, they at least sometimes were, were drinking beer out of cups. You know, we're, we're pretty certain about the straw thing, but without this residue analysis, it's been difficult to, to make the argument for beer from cups. It's great to have the two facets of the evidence. Um, it, was beer traded around the Mediterranean the way wine was? Karen wants mm -hmm. to know. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Um, the, the immediate answer is no, definitely not in the same way um, that wine um, was traded uh, eventually. Um, and I think that you can argue this from sort of fundamental principles in some ways about the beverages, um, but, and the question of beer storage in Mesopotamia is one that I don't have a very good handle on. The general assumption is that um, it was being consumed basically while it was still fermenting. Um, so um, not in general, something that was being stored up for long periods of time and for example, transported um, in, in jars or something like that. I, the evidence for that, I think, um, I, I'm still interested in looking into a little bit more because there are certainly some jars that seem to be probably for storing beer. Um, so yes, the answer is no, we do not um, have the emergence of a, a beer trade analogous to the wine trade that emerges pretty early um, in this region. Do we um, have much evidence for about being drunk? I mean, was uh, drunkenness in public a bad thing or mm -hmm. not? Right. Yeah, so you know, you mentioned that I, I wrote this recent article about inebriation and the, the evidence that I pulled together drawing on some other, um, some other great articles that have been written on this topic is um, mostly comes from the literary records. So from, you know, um, literature, stories, myths, that kind of thing, where they're often talking about um, the gods drinking and becoming drunk and things like that. So it only pretty rarely do we have um, descriptions of, you know, that are about people um, getting drunk. And so it's, um, it, you know, it's, it, it's not perfect evidence for this, but they certainly recognize this connection between beer and inebriation and often beer and wine and inebriation. So they recognized that those two had, had something in common um, because that's not a given uh, this, you know, we recognize their, the presence of alcohol in both of these, um, but there, that's a, that's a recent um, essentially invention of this with this recognition of, of alcohol as a common ingredient in all these different beverages. You get all kinds of, uh, in history, all kinds of different systems of class, classification that there's no necessary reason that they would associate those two beverages, but we certainly get that them associated in Mesopotamia with inebriation. And, and Karen also asked, was there any acknowledgement of medicinal benefits? So there's the happiness part. It's yeah, right. Really sound. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't, I don't know the the medical text well, but there are actually lots of um, medical texts available from Mesopotamia, especially as you get into later periods, so the first millennium BC. Um, and beer does make an appearance. Um, it is certainly, in some cases, a part of remedies for various things. You know, beer plus some other ingredients. Um, at the same time, in those medical texts, you also get what seem to be um, sort of diagnoses related to the effects of people who are drinking too much beer, either, you know, um, at one time, or perhaps people who were drinking too much beer over a longer period of time, 
in the sort of realm of alcoholism. Um, so you get you sort of both beer playing a role in medicines, but also um, discussion of the uh, negative effects of beer. We have an interesting question from Morgan about what you might have ignored. Um, you touched on how much the experimentation makes a difference. What what are some things you might have ignored without that kind of experimentation? Right. Yeah. I mean, that's a good question. Um, so, my immediate thought. I mean, let me try to see what would be most important. Well, some things that maybe maybe we should have been able to figure out on our own, but just simple things like. Okay, so they were um, using date syrup, but when were they using it? This is a key, when in the process were they using date syrup? It's, it, this is a key question. Does it go in before fermentation so that it's adding sugars so that you get a higher alcohol content uh, beverage or is it added afterwards for sweetening and flavoring and that kind of thing? Um, and sure, you could, you could certainly figure out on your own that that was um, a question we should ask, but there's all kinds of things that might seem obvious like that that don't really jump out at you necessarily until you try to try to do this. Like our early on in this project, our sort of process was we met up with the brewers in, in, in Cleveland and in Chicago a number of times and had really animated discussions about things. But then we kind of um, communicated via email a lot. They would we, we'd send them a description of how we think brewing uh, worked. And then they would look at that and say, oh, there's all kinds of stuff that doesn't make sense in here. Um, and they would respond with a list of, I don't know, 30 questions that we would get and say, ah, every one of these questions would take years to find a good answer to. Um, and so we would do our best, come up with those and sort of, and then back and forth and back and forth. So that kind of part of the project, I, I really enjoyed. I mean, just trying to think of other things here that come to mind. One big one is the BAPIR, um, which, um, everyone knows, in a sense, that this is a, a key ingredient that we don't really understand perfectly. Um, but just personally, I know that going into this, I hadn't thought that carefully about the fact that, well, we know that there was, that the Bapier was associated with an oven, the, the Bapier oven. But of course, if you want to argue, as we were trying to argue, that maybe this Bapier was serving as a yeast source, well, the problem is if you bake it, as you normally think about baking bread, that kills off the yeast and it doesn't serve as an effective yeast source. And so we had to think a little bit differently. So we brought in an artisanal baker in Cleveland who helped tried to help us think through this, you know, what would make sense. And um, so we end up with this essentially baking the bread at a really low temperature so that it's just kind of drying it out um, and maintaining that yeast culture um, yeast and other things like bacteria. Um, and so you're just kind of drying it out for preservation purposes, um, which again is something that one could sort of logically find your way towards. But I know personally, it was just something that I hadn't confronted. Um, uh, there's other, other things that come to mind are when we were there, when I, you know, there with the brewers trying to actually do this, they would say things like, wait a minute, how are we supposed to get the get things from that vessel into this vessel. And just simple little things like that, that we had, oh, well, did they need something else that was involved in transferring these? Um, I don't know, that's some examples that come to my mind, but things like that, yeah. Related to um, ingredients, there are a couple of questions about hops, you know, hmm. what they are, why were they unknown for, for beer purposes? Yeah, okay, so I mean, hops are really one of the key flavoring ingredients in many uh, barley beers today. And basically, um, it's a, a climbing vine, the same family as marijuana. Um, it's, it especially contributes the bitterness to um, beers today, but also all kinds of um, flavors related to the resins and the hops. Um, so like citrus kind of flavors and piney flavors and things like that. Um, and so, for instance, if you're an IPA drinker, um, IPAs really foreground the, the hops as a, a flavoring element for both the bittering and the, the flavoring. So yeah, there were a number of questions about this. Um, and so there was a question about were, did they have hops and they just chose not to use them in their beer or did they not have hops? And there have been uh, debates about this in the past about um, 
particular words in the local languages that might have referred to hops. And there have been sort of, as those spun out, uh, the consensus these days is in the written record, we have no clear evidence for hops. And I think the same is true archeologically. We don't have any evidence that hops existed in the region um, at this time. Uh, and so it's not just that they were choosing not to use them. It's that as far as we can tell, they did not have hops. Um, was that all the angles on that question? I think Another so. Question. Yeah. Um, there's yeah. a liver question. Um, the okay. liver, you know, making the liver happy obviously was right. no, yes. you know, that reading livers was something Mesopotamians did, but what, what did they mean that beer was good for your liver and made you? Yeah. Um, I always, you know, I get this, I, I get this question regularly and I forget to go look into this um, and see what word is actually being translated as that um, in that particular translation. I don't know if it's being translated um, as if that's the literal word liver there. Um, I think it's in the sense that they considered the liver a sort of fundamental central organ um, and that this is kind of referring in that general way to the liver, not in terms of the specific effects of alcohol on the liver or something like that. Um, uh, what was this? What was the second part of that? Just for that you. Well, I think I was throwing something about the, the liver making the liver being oh, yes. just that. Yes, and I I always I I love to bring up this issue of you know omens and ecstasy which if you're not familiar with this, is just a fascinating element of kind of the production of knowledge in Mesopotamia, how they collected um, information about the world. They have all kinds of omens that were recognized, but one particularly important means was um, sacrificing um, sheep and examining their livers. And there's a whole tradition of, of, of interpretation called ecstasy. Um, which is, is fascinating. So again, it's showing the kind of importance of the liver um, in general. Um, Tate, could you talk for a minute about the parallels, if any, between records of beer making in Mesopotamia and Egypt mm. or, or oh, yeah. other ancient civilizations? Yeah. Um, so I just, um, for the second time, taught my alcohol in the ancient world class. So it's kind of on my brain at the moment where we sort of do a comparative look um, at uh, different early beverage traditions. Um, the situation in Egypt um, is that around the same time is when we have uh, a, maybe a little earlier in Egypt, it really is first sort of solid evidence for beer. And again, it's a barley based beer, sometimes with um, emmer wheat also involved. Um, the, maybe the biggest difference, and there often have been parallels um, cited between these. One of the biggest differences is in Egypt, you get these wonderful artistic depictions of brewing. Um, and it's actually very common in tombs, for example, on the walls to show the brewing process. And you get to see little pictures of all the different vessels that were employed and things like that. And we have so little like that in uh, Mesopotamia. Um, and they often uh, also made little wooden models of brewing scenes that would be included in um, tombs, like three-dimensional models uh, of brewing scenes. Um, so one element um, that has often been discussed as something they might have held in common is the potential use of, a, of bread um, to make their beer. And there's been lots of discussion of this in Egypt. Um, for a long time, it was assumed, um, and not without some reason, that bread was in, involved, partly on based on the interpretation of these brewing scenes, which seemed to show the pressing of cakes or breads through a sieve, um, maybe wetting them and pressing them through a sieve um, and then allowing them to um, ferment in uh, water. Um, and often the um, very explicit analogies were made to a more recent brewing tradition for this beverage called booza um, that um, has been brewed in Egypt um, traditionally and that does involve um, bread as a key brewing ingredient. Then in the last couple of decades, there's been um, a good bit of work looking at residues of beer in Egypt. And there's been um, an, an argument that at least not all beer uh, was brewed with this with bread as an element. So you can look at the microscopic remains and make an argument for whether or not there was any bread-like element involved. So there has often been assumed to be a connection there with Mesopotamia, but um, 
And in both cases, it's uncertain, basically. We were uncertain about the role of, of this bread-like product in Mesopotamia also. Let's see, uh, go ahead, yeah. Well, I was just going to say to everybody, I, we, we've been going on for quite a while, but we still have interesting questions, so we will keep going, but we want to be sensitive to your time. Um, so we'll, we'll go for a little bit longer. Um, and you just saw something you wanted to answer, Tate. So what was that? Go ahead. Oh, did I? I thought you were signaling that. But oh, no, sorry. I didn't mean to. Okay. Well, there's a question about um, female brewers and the respect that might be accorded to them and... Um, to what degree a tavern and prostitution association might be a negative or be neutral? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm not sure that I really know the answer to this. I think this question of, for instance, male versus female brewers is one that needs more work in Mesopotamia. I think my immediate impression is that um, when you're talking about brewers who worked for the, the palaces and the temples and things, they tend to be um, men. Whereas when you're talking about tavern keepers and um, the little bits of evidence for home brewing that we, you're, that we get, you're often talking about women. Um, I don't know of any specific evidence for the, the sort of level of respect um, accorded either of these positions. Um, the question about prostitution and the association with taverns is also an interesting one, I think. And again, it's one that I don't, I don't feel like I know an answer to exactly. Certainly there are cases where prostitutes are depicted in a negative light, um, but I don't think that that's necessarily an across the board thing. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that I can give a very good answer to that, but I, I think it's a good question. Okay. It's interesting that there are female brewers and they're called out and female tavern keepers. Yeah. Um, this may be a question from just from talking to you, uh, on no, numerous occasions now, I think you'll find this hard, but <laughs> okay. it's whether there's a, a mo you gave us great recommendations for beers that had certain characteristics mm. of ancient oh. fruit. Is, is there any single beer that you could pull out that would <laughs> encompass that? Would, would a non-craft beer of some kind of, with malted barley give any real indication or is it just too hopeless? Well, I don't, uh, a non-craft beer, I'm not sure exactly. Um, I put it the, that way because all the beers you referenced were sort of- Oh, right, I see. Craft beers. Um, I mean, there's, uh, <laughs> I don't know for one thing, you know, we certainly don't know exactly what their beers were like. Um, that'll be an ongoing project. You know, we did our best um, to, to create what we, uh, what we thought was a reasonable, um, you know, facsimile, but it's almost certainly not perfect. Um, I personally, I would say, um, God, is there a single beer? I don't, I don't think I can say any particular one. I think certainly the sour dimension, that sort of acidic dimension is something that um, almost certainly was a, a dominant component of these beers. Um, just based um, in part on their, you know, relative ability to control the the cultures of yeast and bacteria and things involved. So I think to me, that's particularly important. Um, I guess we don't really know about the question of carbonation. There are occasionally suggestions that they were including stoppers in there in beer jars that would have allowed for the buildup of some carbonation, which basically you get by when the yeast are going about their, their fermenting, they give off carbon dioxide. Uh, and so if you have, if they're in a sealed environment, then that carbon dioxide accumulates, giving you your, your carbonation. And so I think that's an interesting question. In general, my assumption is that these beers were probably um, not uh, carbonated in that, you know, in the sense of many of our beers today, especially if they're drinking them out of a big open vessel. Um, and so that's something that would, that really kind of would distinguish them, I guess, my immediate thought is that some other tr brewing traditions where you still have pretty traditional brewing going on, like um, African brewing traditions, might give us a better analog. But of course, it's very difficult to get access to, um, to those. Um, and I haven't personally tasted them, but I would love to go try some of these. Um, and often they are consumed in the same way from, a, from long straws. Um, they often use different grains like millet and sorghum 
Um, and I'm not entirely sure how, you know, that will certainly um, contribute a diff some different elements to the, to the beer. But um, I wish I had a good answer to this, this question, <laughs> but I don't really. <laughs> Well, it's too tough <laughs> as yeah. part of the complexity of it all. And what you were just saying ties into uh, a question from Peter about whether present day villages in the same areas have brewing practices and recipes that would hint at ancient practice. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, the immediate answer is not to my knowledge. Um, you know, with the, um, with, with this is an, essentially an Islamic society, these days, and so there are prohibitions against alcohol. It doesn't mean that no one drinks alcohol, but you, I, I don't know of um, sort of strong sort of traditional uh, traditions of brewing um, in the region. And maybe that's just something that's um, kind of under the radar that I'm not aware of. I would certainly be interested if it is, but uh, that's the immediate answer. And I mean, I just mentioned that in Egypt, um, I don't know if Buza is still being brewed at the moment, but up into the 70s, for example, it was still being brewed um, commonly. One of the great things about Tate is that he's telling us what he does know, and he's also telling us what we can't know yet. And <laughs> that's actually a really, really good thing for- uh, I warned you, I warned you that that was gonna yeah. be a common answer. It's, it's not always totally satisfying when we want the one answer, but it's the truth. So it's really great. And I wanna thank everybody for joining us to learn about ancient beer. And Tate, thank you for all the wonderful and fun information. And say hi, goodbye to everybody and that we hope to see you soon at another Getty program. Thanks everybody. <laughs>